are you all doing? We're doing great. Right. So tell me what you've seen or you haven't seen that you want to see, other than a launch. Uh, I know you want to see that. A drone. A the drone. Engine. Oh. We got any drones? We do. Are they going to see a drone? <laughs> they can make that happen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay. So what did I see this morning? We'll see. The rain center, the rocket. I mean, what's been the most impressive thing? So the rocket. The rocket. <laughs> now who's who's been who's been to a lot? How many of you? Down at the Cape or yeah. here? Here, here in the Cape. Cape. So you, great. All right. Good. So did you already tell them that the camera's down? Yes. You gave them my speech? Yes. About you gotta, you gotta take it in if yeah. it's your first one and just watch yeah. it. And, and you know, you're you're a little bit closer here than you are down at the Cape if you've been there before. So stuff gets to you quicker, but it still comes in waves. So you, you'll see it, then you'll hear it, and then you'll feel it. And I, I'm an emotional person, so I, I always say the feeling part is the one that really gets you. Uh, so just allow yourself to do it. And it's like I tell people all the time, uh, you all have really revolutionized the way we are able to communicate with people uh, because you talk to friends and neighbors and everything else and uh, and what you do is you explain what we're doing in your own in your own words and, and in the way you know how to do it so we're able to reach and communicate with people that we were just not not getting to before it, by the millions as a matter of fact so the thing I would ask you to do is continue to do what you've been doing tell them about tonight tell them about how you feel uh, as much as don't 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 dwell on technical stuff. If you're a technical person, just say, man, this was if it was awesome, it, this was awesome. If it wasn't, you know, if it sucked, then <laughs> let one of us know first, <laughs> <laughs> and then why, why you thought it sucked, and then tell them, you know, I was disappointed or something like that. My guess is <coughs> some some one or two of you might be disappointed for some reason, but uh, it's it's it should be a beautiful night. We got a lot of different things going on. In fact, um, about half an hour before we launch, uh, station's going to go over here, so you should have an opportunity to see that. That in itself is spectacular. It's going to be really clear tonight, so it, it'll be. Usually, when it goes over, it's brighter than most stars you see, and so you won't miss it. Uh, the Chinese are actually launching about half an hour before we launch. Uh, crew of how many? Stephanie, two. two going to Tiangong for a month. So there's a lot of space stuff going on tonight. Um, any questions for me that I can try to answer for you? None? Yes? <laughs> what are you most proud of and most excited oh, about right now? I mean, I, you probably have a, a yeah. ton of things, but. No, I, I think when you talk about NASA, the thing I'm most proud of is our people. It, you know, we. And I, I tell people all the time, everybody has their own ideas about what NASA is and who we are. And um, everybody thinks about shuttles and rocket ships and stuff like that. Uh, I'm very proud of the fact that we have really put more attention, once again, on aeronautics. Uh, the fact that we're getting ready to build some X-planes. So everybody's not a rocket person. Um, NASA's foundation is actually in aeronautics. We, you know, we came from the old NACA, the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics. So we're a little bit more than 100 years old. Uh, and I'm, I'm very proud of that, the fact that our people are, uh, feel that they work in the best place in the government. That's really, really, really important. So we've, we've been there for the last four years and, and doing pretty well this year. So everybody's exciting to find out whether, they, whether they're the best place to work in government for the fifth time. So, so we're kind of pretending that we're not really concerned about it, but we are. <laughs> uh, that would be nice, to be quite honest. Um, and, and then I'm, I'm incredibly proud of the progress that we're making on the journey to Mars. You know, the president really, uh, he put a lot of trust in us. I, I, you look at different things that, I talked to some people, anybody in here know anything about Apollo, other than what you read? Yeah. No. Okay, somebody said yes. And I, I try to explain to people, you know, because I'm on a, I'm an Apollo era person, although I, I'm a shuttle guy. I've never flown on space stations, so I really have, when you talk about the experience of operating on station, I have no clue. Um, so for me, my big thing is shuttle, uh, but that's the, that's the past. Um, I can identify with Apollo because I was a young student in pilot training in Meridian, Mississippi. And we, uh, 
we rushed to sit in front of a TV and watch Neil Armstrong descend to the surface of the moon. And that was huge back then. But, but for you all, I think you're, you're all looking for your Apollo experience. And I think we're, that's what we're building on right now. You know, Landing on Mars is a long way away, that, admittedly. That's 14 years from now. And that's a long time. But the things we're doing in the interim on the journey to Mars, putting Curiosity on Mars, uh, helping the Indians be the first nation ever to get to Mars the first time they attempted with an orbiter. Uh, we're working with the United Arab Emirates right now on uh, you know something they call the Emirati Mars mission that they want to launch in late 2020 to get there on the 50th anniversary of the founding of the United Arab Emirates. And it, you, you may say why, and it's because when you look at Mars is like any other planet. We want to know as much about it as we can to help us understand more about our own planet. And so we've got two instruments right now in Mars orbit looking at its atmosphere. MAVEN, which is ours, is looking at the upper atmosphere. The Indians' mom, the Mars orbit mission, is looking at the lower atmosphere. And the United Arab Emirates wants to look at the middle atmosphere. So we'll complete the suite of sensors that are, that are studying the Martian atmosphere in 2021 if and when the Emiratis get there. So there is a purpose in it. It's not just, people always say, why? You know, what, why do we want to send humans to Mars? I, I believe because we're, we're innately curious. And you can bring me all the evidence you want from a robotic vehicle, but until I or somebody like me has an opportunity to go out there and reach down and take it in their hand and say, wow, this is, uh, this is real. And it's, it, it really is like this. That'll be good. I think that'll be the time that we will conclusively decide whether life existed there once or whether life exists there now or whether we can sustain life there because you'll put humans on the surface and then you'll find out you know, whether or not it's, it's a very, very hostile place or whether it's just a hostile place like a lot of other places that humans live. We believe it's a hostile place that's like a lot of other places. It's no worse than Antarctica, we don't think. Radiation-wise, maybe yes, but we think we can handle it. So being, being on the journey to Mars, fulfilling the President's charge to us and, and his trust in NASA to you know, to be able to get people there, especially the way we've done it, bringing in commercial entities, bringing in international partners. It's, it's, not, it's not your grandfather's Apollo program at all. This is not just the United States, and I think that's, that's really critical. Partnerships is huge for us, international, commercial, academic. So you asked me what time it was, and I built you a watch. <laughs> yes. I love it. Okay, so the United Nations 2015 Global Risk Report stating that water scarcity <laughs> environmental journalists. I, that's good, that's good. Stating that water scarcity is going to be our biggest threat of conflict worldwide. Yeah. How soon do you think and what is your gut feeling where we will find water that we may be able to access somewhere close to us? Well, you know, some people believe and People need to understand, everybody accuses us of having abandoned the moon. We have not. Um, we are going to be in cislunar space, in, in lunar orbit, for 10 years, beginning as early as 2018. And we'll be there because that's the next important stepping stone to putting humans on Mars. And that's why we talk about this journey. Um, we have a, um, a satellite right now, a mission called uh, OSIRIS-REx. They launched on the 8th of last month, and it'll get to an asteroid called Bennu uh, in about a year or so, and it'll spend about a year or more kind of perusing Bennu to make sure it, we've decided on what's a good landing site. And then we're going to go down within meters of the surface and have a big arm come down out of, out of Osiris Rex and penetrate the surface, and kick up dust and dirt, and then capture as much of it as we can, put it on a canister, bring it back and in 2023 it will return to Earth and be dropped in that canister out in the Utah desert. So that will be the first time we'll actually have a, a, a substantive sample from an asteroid. A lot of people believe, a lot of scientists believe that there are many asteroids that are not that much unlike Earth. There may be water. Uh, the moon we know has, has water in certain places. Mars without a question has water. Now whether or not you're going to be able to find a way to you know, capture that and get it back to help conditions on Earth, that remains to be seen. I think what's most important is to use what we learn from asteroids and Mars and the Moon to help understand the, our own environment here back on Earth. Because 
we're going through a lot of changes, particularly in the climate. And a lot of our stress in terms of water, food, everything else is attributable to the changing climate. So if we understood better what's happening, why is the climate doing what it's doing, and can we change it, can we arrest it, and kind of slow things down, we may find that the crisis for water uh, actually you know, gets curtailed a little bit. Um, but it is, I could not agree more if you talk to, you've heard any chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff for the last four or five when he asked what they feel is the most significant threat to security, they all say the environment. And people are startled. You know, they go, what do you mean? What about this? What about that? And, and they say, the environment today is causing people to, to live in poverty. It's causing people to be hunger, hungry, without food, without water. And we've got to fix that. So I think what we're doing with our planetary missions, the mission to Mars, mission back to the moon, um, we'll probably find some answers that may help. So, yeah. How do you feel about the commercial competition? It's not competition, first of all. Commercial, the, the commercial space industry, the, the burgeoning commercial space industry, we look at as partners. We help establish it. Uh, you know, people forget that. We, we, had it not been for NASA deciding that we were going to make an investment in commercial space, it would not exist. Uh, I think if you ask David Thompson or any of his folk from Orbital, or you ask Elon from SpaceX, they'll tell you they got their start because NASA was willing to make the investment. You know, we, um, we're sort of the vanguard of commercial space. Am I happy with where we are? No, because I thought, I actually thought we would be much farther along with commercial space development than we are today. We have to have a vibrant, sustainable low Earth orbit infrastructure from which we can go to get to Mars, unless we have, um, you know, a commercial infrastructure in low Earth orbit that we can migrate out, not leaving Earth, but migrate it, have it grow out to lunar orbit, and then help us get to Mars, uh, it's going to be awfully hard to get to Mars. So I, I don't look at it as competition at all. You, you got things like NanoRex, uh, SpaceX Orbital, Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic, I mean, it goes all the way from the, from the suborbital folk to the orbital and soon uh, interplanetary commercial capability. We're looking at habitats, uh, we're looking at all kinds of things that we feel commercial entities have better ideas than we do sometimes. And what we try to do is make the technologies available to them to speed them on their way. If you look at, when you talk about, people always talk about technology. If you look at whether you're talking about Blue Origin or you're talking about SpaceX or anybody else, the technology that they're using for their systems are generally technologies that were developed in the early Mercury, Gemini, Apollo days, whether it's an engine or whether it's an environmental control system. But they're trying to help us make it even better because it's, we've got to have much more viable, resilient, reliable systems than we have today on the International Space Station. You can't have something that's breaking every other month, not when you're on your way to Mars. So you've talked to a lot of astronauts who lived on board the International yeah, Space Station. Yeah. If you were to live for six months on the International Space Station, what kinds of things would you find like the most exciting to do? Oh, well, you know, if I, if I try to equate it or, or relate it to my experience on shuttle, uh, without a doubt, the two most exciting, exhilarating things to me were senses. They were the sense of vision. Uh, looking at this planet from the vantage point of space, it is unlike anything you've ever imagined in your life. Um, you leave here with a lot of doubts about humanity and all other kinds of stuff, and then you look back on the planet, and you, it is the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. Um, thing that brought me to tears, my very first flight, within minutes of leaving, you know, the Kennedy Space Center, launching and getting out into space, and about 10, 15 minutes into the flight, we were going over the British Isles and, and Western Europe, and then I looked up and saw this big island, I thought, and it turned out to be the continent of Africa, uh, <laughs> which for me was mind-boggling. And I had prepared for that moment, uh, being a person, obviously, of African descent, um, and knowing that, that my, my ancestors had probably come from somewhere in West Africa. I spent a lot of time learning the geography of Africa so I would know where Nigeria was, and Liberia. I wanted to know where all the countries were so I'd know what I was looking at. Um, I, I was incredibly disappointed in, in, a, in a way because 
when I looked down there, I didn't see any lines. There were, there were, no, there were no lines down there. It was just one incredibly beautiful continent that just progressed from the desert, you know, and you went from the Mediterranean and the beautiful Mediterranean coast right into the desert with its own unique color, then down into the jungles and everything, else, <coughs> all the way down to the Cape. And, and it, it just looked so peaceful. And it looked like, like it is. It's one just massive planet with one people on it. I, you realize, I realize that we live, in a, we live on an ocean world. And it's one ocean. It's not, it, there are not a lot of different oceans. We name them differently depending on where they are. But it's one ocean, and it has these bodies of land, you know, that stick up in it at various places. Those bodies we generally call continents. And every once in a while, you see some smaller ones that are identified as islands. And every once in a while, some of them that I used to see on my space shuttle missions, you don't even see them anymore because the rising sea level, they've just disappeared from, from our Earth. They're, they're under the surface, but, but we may never see them again. Um, so that, that's one thing. That's the visual thing. And then the other one is just the feel. Uh, having the ability to to live uh, Newton's laws of motion, you know, where uh, because gravity is overcome, it's still there, but you're going around Earth so fast that the centrifugal force that's created won't let gravity pull you back to Earth. You're constantly falling. You're just in constant free fall, and and your body and and the spaceship is trying to get back to Earth, but centrifugal force won't let it happen, and so you're in this in this in this balance, perfect balance between gravity and centrifugal force, and your body floats. And so, you know, Sir Isaac Newton said, let you be alone and nothing happen to you, and you're going to stay right there. And sure enough, you come out of your seat, and you draw your hands in, and you don't move. You get your food, and you open it up, and you decide, well, I want a cup of coffee. And you go floating off to get a cup of coffee, and Leave your food right there. You come back, and your food is still just sitting right there in midair. You know, you take your spoon and you put it next to your food. And you float away, and you come back, and it's still sitting there. Um, or if you take like an M and M, like we like to do when we're playing, and you just gently release it from your hand, it goes back and forth across the cabin. It'll hit the bulkhead, and it'll bounce back and forth. It, it just goes forever and ever and ever. It slows down because energy gets absorbed every time it hits the wall. But there is no gravity to pull it down to the floor, so it doesn't do this as it goes back and forth. It just goes back and forth and gets slower and slower. Those two sensations I find absolutely phenomenal. To have an opportunity to do that and play in it for six months, a year at a time, uh, I just I think is mind-boggling. And also, to have the room that you have aboard station, to have the cupola, the picture window, if you will, the bay window, down uh, on the earth side of, of one of the modules there, where you get this 360 degree panorama of space plus looking down at Earth, I, I find mind boggling. So that's plus all the science you're doing today. We, we do 200 and some odd experiments a year on station. Cygnus tonight is taking five or six new experiments up. Uh, that's what I think is really exciting about what's going on on station. And knowing that you're bringing us one step closer to humans being able to go to Mars. Yeah. Uh, Last question. What you, okay. What do you miss most about I'll get you. I'll get you. What do you miss most about being in orbit? Oh, what do I miss most about being in orbit? Being there. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of, I don't think there's any one thing that, that you miss most, but it's the, the ability to have the two sensual sensations that I just talked about. Um, there, is no, there is no other place to experience that other than being out in space uh, where you're free, uh, that, that's probably the thing, and, and the fact that during the period of time that you're in space, the world is one. Um, I can only imagine, you know, my, my last flight was the first joint Russian-American mission. One of my crew members was Sergei, Sergei Krikalov, a veteran Russian cosmonaut who today is the head of their human spaceflight program. Uh, Sergei was incredible. I mean, just the prince of an individual. Of, incredibly competent and capable engineer and pilot. Um, having an opportunity to train with him for a couple of years and then fly with him and have him remain, we're friends, our families are friends. We have been since 1992 when we came together the first time. Um, or knowing people from other countries with whom I've worked. Um, it just, that's what you miss is 
is being in an environment where the world is all one, everybody's pulling together. Um, you know, Russian cosmonauts and American astronauts, as far as they're concerned, the world is what they're doing on station. They know there's a lot of stuff going on down here, but they really try, they try to put it out of their minds because they're focused on a mission, which is to try to help us understand the human body more, help us understand our environment more, and helping us to, we all want to go to Mars. Everybody, every nation wants to go to Mars, and they, and they want to follow us there. there. There's some that don't have the wherewithal right now, and so they really want to do some stuff on the moon, and we're trying to facilitate their ability to do that. With SLS and Orion, uh, we'll have the lift capability to take anybody's lander that wants to land on the moon. And in my mind, anybody, any nation that can put a lander together that we can land astronauts on the moon, that is humanity landing on the moon. It's not, it's not the U.S. When we go to Mars, a lot of people say, you know, the first American astronaut, well, the first human person to land on Mars. It, it, it's, a, it's, an, it's an initiative of humanity. That's the way the president posed it in, 20, you know, in 2010 when he gave his speech down at the Kennedy Space Center. And that's the way I look at it. You've had your hand up a long time. Oh, that's okay. okay. Um, I have a one-year-old at home, and so I just wanted to uh, ask if you had any advice for him. Uh, can he read yet? Uh, you no, know, I'm just kidding. <laughs> He's trying. I'm just kidding. Yeah, if you can, it, if, you'll have to explain this to him in three or four years, or depending on when he understands stuff. But my my words to him are really simple, and you're going to tell him this all his life. Study really hard. Uh, work his little backside off to you know to pursue whatever it is that that he wants to do. And then the biggest thing is n never ever ever be afraid of failure. Um, but you've got to encourage him to be a risk taker. You got to encourage him to be a, a very smart risk taker. So. Um, encourage him to take as much math and science as you can, such that when he goes out and does something that you think is stupid, uh, in his mind it's not because he's measured all the risk and everything else. I, I, that would be what I would tell him. I'd tell him he's, he's, he has come into a phenomenal world. Uh, no matter what anybody says, things are good. Um, we just, we just, we just got to work really hard to make it better. Um, I, I firmly believe that. So, uh, who else had a hand up? I'm, and I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. Somebody else back there had a hand up for a long time. Okay, then right there. Um, I'm curious, obviously you have some interesting insights into the upcoming election. Specifically, I know Believe that... Believe it or not, I don't. Well, <laughs> <laughs> generally, generally when the elections happened, especially when like, Bush came in and then yep. when Obama came in, there were shifts in policy, there were shifts in direction about NASA. Are you hearing anything specifically from either Clinton or from Trump? We're not, and uh, you know, other than what you hear, you know, I, I read all the trade journals, so I see what they send in as their responses to questions they asked by Space News or, or the Wall Street Journal or other things, and, and I'm not really worried about it. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to do at NASA is, remember how I told you at the very beginning, you all have revolutionized the way we communicate with the, with the public? Um, we don't tell our story very well. Uh, we're much better than we used to be because we now have your help and we have a lot of other people, a lot of, and I don't mean this in a pejorative manner because I'm an old person, older, I'm not old, um, but people who are much younger than I am tend to be much more savvy with comms, whether it's social media, whether it's just talking to people, you can relate. Uh, you know, I have a hard time relating because I'm a I'm a Vietnam era, Apollo era, shuttle era person. That is all so yesterday, you know, to be quite honest. And so what we're trying to do is put our story together in today language so that when the transition teams come in, or team, whichever it is, that we explain to them who we are, what we do, why what we've been doing over the last seven years, more than that actually, but particularly over the last seven years since the president you know, said, okay, we're going to Mars, and we're going with the intent of staying and going farther out into the solar system, that we took that challenge seriously, and we're really on a good path to Mars, that we've, res we've there's a resurgence in aeronautics, not only in this country, but around the world, but a lot of it's due to NASA's leadership, and that I challenge anybody uh, to question the science that has come out of, of NASA through our collaborations with academia and industry and international partners over the last, I don't know how many years, but particularly the last five years or so. You know, you, every time you look up, uh, Juno going to Jupiter, uh, 
New Horizons, passing by Pluto, Curiosity, landing on Mars, uh, Osiris Rex, on it, well on its way now to Bennu, and and in you know in seven more years it's going to be back here for the first time ever with samples from a from an asteroid. Um, understanding our climate a little bit better and helping through programs that we like like Severe that we have with the U.S. Agency for International Development, helping people around the world tackle the, the handle the problem of lack of water, lack of clean water, the largest cause of death in infants in the world, the largest cause of infant mortality is waterborne pathogens, <coughs> dirty water. And the types of technology that we're developing on the International Space Station with our water recycling system, uh, you know, we astronauts, they drink the water they drank yesterday, today, because of the water purification system we have on board. Those same systems are the basis for, for miniaturized systems that are now in third world countries and, and actually in some, some less fortunate areas of the United States to give people clean drinking water. That's going to reduce the amount of uh, you know, deaths in infants. Uh, looking at things, NASA science helping people like the Carter Foundation or, um, with uh, solve the problem of river blindness. A lot of that stuff is work that, that we're, in, we're doing every single day. And I'm, so when you talk about what am I proud of, I'm, I'm proud that we can talk about stuff that we've done to make life better for human beings. That's, that's essentially what we're doing. So you all have been great, and I apologize for going so long. Oh. <laughs> Thank you.